So, um, by way of introduction, um, appearances can be deceiving. Um, if you wanted to make a stuffed animal that looked like a moth, you might use the spongy moth uh, for your model. It, uh, it's, it's fuzzy. It has two antennae that look like rabbit ears. Um, the spotted lantern beetle is another example. Um, colorful beetle with interesting patterns of dots on its back. Uh, to the layperson, it may look uh, like a ladybug even. Um, but uh, those two are very uh, inv non-native, invasive species that are very destructive. The cicada, on the other hand, has bulbous orange eyes, vein, veiny wings, um, it looks very alien and threatening, uh, but that is part of our ecosystem and has some benefits um, to our environment, uh, which we'll hear more about today. Um, so that goes to say that appearances um, aren't everything, and tonight um, our presenters are going to talk about the three insects uh, that I mentioned. So we have Dr. Frederick Miller. Um, Dr. Miller is um, uh, with the uh, Morton Arboretum. He's the senior scientist of entomology. Um, he currently serves as the acting forest health specialist for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, uh, actively involved in the Illinois chapter of the International Association of Arboriculture and the National Walnut, Walnut Council. Um, he, uh, his applied research focuses on insect um, pests, disease, diseases, and abiotic, that is non-environmental factors affecting urban and rural forests. Um, he received his PhD in urban entomology with a minor in plant pathology from Iowa State University. Then Mike Collins, friend of the Olmstead Society, frequent presenter with us, is the arborist for the village of Riverside um, and has been so for 19 years. Um, prior to his arrival in Riverside, he worked at Cantini Gardens in uh, Winfield? Wheaton. Wheaton. Yep. Um, as the grounds arborist and the Morton Arboretum as a research assistant. He's a certified arborist for 25 years. Um, he volunteers as the municipal director with the Illinois Arborist Association, a co-chair of the Tree Stewardship and Planting Work Group. They are working on the restoration of the urban tree canopy by 2050. And he received his master's from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, where I believe he was a student at one point of Dr. Miller. So I think Dr. Miller will begin the presentation. Okay. So welcome them. Okay. Co-worker, co co-student. Yeah, right. <laughs> Good evening. I'm going to go without the mic. Can you all hear me in the back all right? Good. I have three kids, and I'm used to yelling, so not a problem. <laughs> Good to be with you this evening. Uh, as indicated, I'm going to kind of lead off here, talk about the periodical cicada. We're going to talk a little bit about its biology and what to expect, which I'm not sure what to expect right now with the weather we're having, but we'll see what happens. A little bit on spongy moth, and then Mike's going to... Uh, come up and talk to you about the specific uh, plans you have here for the Riverside area in terms of uh, how you're going to deal with that. So uh, we'll try to make it informal in the sense that if you have immediate questions, feel free to ask as long as we don't get too far afield because we do need to stay on schedule tonight. So uh, also the little cards that came around on the spotted lanternfly, uh, hopefully most of you got one. If you need more, we can get those to you. Uh, they make nice bookmarks if you're not interested in spotted lanternfly. If you deal with the, the honeybee, they're nice for scraping the stingers out, however you'd like to use them. But they're kind of handy to keep in mind uh, if you happen to be out and about and uh, see that particular insect. So, Okay, we're going to talk about the 17-year cicada up here, northern brood as we call it. Uh, last time this showed up was in 2007. Uh, the other one, the 13-year, is going to be the one uh, basically in southern Illinois. Uh, we will have a little bit of an overlap uh, down just a little bit north of Springfield, Petersburg area, if you're familiar with the Lincoln Sites, New Salem area, and a little bit to the east of there towards Decatur. That's where it's going to get really noisy, uh, and people will probably think the end of the world's coming, but it's not, okay? <laughs> Up here, it'll just be our normal 17-year uh, event. So just to be clear, Cicadas are not locusts. You may hear that in the media. You may have heard that in the past. First of all, locusts are grasshoppers. They're just migratory grasshoppers. They have chew. I'll try to stay out of your line of sight there. Uh, chewing mouthparts, 
They eat plants, chew them up. If you've ever uh, dealt with that, you know that they can be quite destructive. I had a great aunt that lived out in western Kansas as a young girl, and she wrote in her memoirs about how the crickets and the grasshoppers would come through and eat all the crops, and then they'd come in and eat the curtains and their clothing. Because back, yeah, because back in the early 1900s, we didn't have synthetics. Permanent press, all that stuff, everything was out of cotton, natural fibers. So you not only could lose your crops, but you could lose your clothes and your curtains and everything else in the whole shebang. So uh, quite destructive insects, of course. There's still locust plagues in other parts of the world. Cicadas, on the other hand, piercing, sucking mouth parts. Pierce, suck. I don't mean to be crude, but that's the way they feed, okay? Same way the mosquitoes feed. So this summer, I want you to try something with your neighbors, with your friends. Say the mosquitoes are really piercing tonight. <laughs> because that's what they do. They don't bite us. They pierce. Most of your cicadas are going to, I mean, they're all going to come out in large numbers, but a given cicada typically comes out uh, as an individual, all right, even though they make up for that in numbers. And they are the different, different species and different schedule than what we call the annual cicada, which we hear late summer and into early fall. So uh, they're the big, much larger cicadas that have the green and black markings on their bodies and then the clear wings and the silver underbelly. All right, Those are, that's a whole different critter altogether. Whoop. All right, I know it's going to be hard to see in the back. I will point out the colors. The brown we have here is our northern brood, as we call it. You can see it's going to catch virtually all of north. Oh, good. Northern Illinois. That jumped on me. That's good. It's going to overlap a little bit over in northeast Iowa. We're going to share a little bit with them and our Wisconsin friends to the north. But the bulk of them will be coming out in this area right here. The blue, light blue, which encompasses most of Missouri, all the southern part of Illinois, and really parts of the south and southeast, is the 13-year cicada. That's normal schedule. Nothing unusual about that. As I pointed out, the real interesting area will be right along in here. Like I said, just a little bit north of Springfield, a little bit east towards Decatur. That's where you'll have both. And if you and I were trying to talk to each other, we'd have to be yelling, much louder than I am right now. That's how noisy it'll be. I grew up in Kansas City. We had a joint emergence there uh, back in 1998, and uh, my nieces and nephews were visiting there from Cal or Colorado. They, of course, we don't have the cicadas east of the Rockies, or excuse me, west of the Rockies, rather, and uh, it was quite an experience for them, but we had to yell at each other to communicate outside. That's how loud it was. Okay, on the right now you can see the stippled area over here is the northern brood again. The diagonal lines would be the southern, and then again that little overlap area there is where we're going to see the, the joint emergence. Okay, last time this happened, Thomas Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark to the northwest to find out what he bought. <laughs> Sight unseen. Louisiana Purchase. So two, over 200 years ago is the last time this mathematically happened. I'm pretty confident I won't be around for the next one. So, <laughs> But uh, quite an interesting history there when you look at that and uh, the fact that, uh, you know, all the things that have taken place since then, of course. So there are uh, three species that make up the northern brood. You can see them here listed. Uh, four that make up the southern brood. They're all different species. Now, they can tend to uh, hybridize to a certain extent, but they pretty much keep to themselves. And I know this may sound a little goofy, but when this, hap when this event happens here in a few weeks or a month maybe, if you listen real closely, you can actually tell the difference between the calls. Now, they call each other, but that noise they make that we find, some people find very obnoxious, that's how they're communicating with each other. They don't have social media. They don't have dating services to find each other. They have to do it by putting out a certain uh, frequency of sound. And we call that calling. And if you listen closely, you can hear the different species. They're subtle, but you, you can pick up on it. So that's the way they communicate. One of the big questions I've been getting is, when are they going to show up? 
They won't tell me. <laughs> I'm talking about the cicadas now. All right. If you are involved with growing plants or observed anything at all, I think if we could interview the plants, I think they would be very, very confused after this winter and spring that we've had. And here we're, what, probably a month ahead, maybe close to it, uh, which is uh, very hard to predict. But some work they did back in Maryland, a colleague of mine, Mike Ropp, uh, at the University of Maryland, and back in 20, when they had their big emergence, uh, they came up with this formula. Basically, bottom line is, they predicted at 64 degrees Fahrenheit at the eight inch depth for soil. That's when they started to emerge. And they've got a very, they got a very good uh, predictive correlation there in Ohio during that year. Also did some work in Kentucky as well. So that's what we're hanging on. We're gonna, we're gonna go for the 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, from what I've heard uh, recently, as of last week, we're in the upper 40s, low 50s on soil temperatures at eight inches. So we got a little ways to go. We'll see what happens. Uh, the wet soils are gonna take longer to warm up than the dry, a dry soil would because of the amount of evaporation that has to take place. I did talk to a colleague of mine yesterday. They said that they were uh, digging down um, just digging around and finding them. So they're pretty close to the surface right now. So um, it could be one of these things that you go to bed one night and wake up the next morning and they're here. <laughs> but we're gonna shoot for the 64 degrees. We're gonna do our best to try to give people as much warning as we can, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Now that will vary, of course, where they are. You know, if they're in a wooded area where they're not getting as much sunlight to dry the soil out, it may take a little longer. Just depends on the situation. How many of you <coughs> remember the 2007 emergence. Okay, good number of you. Okay. A lot of people have asked me, are they going to be as bad, I, I don't like to use the word bad, as exciting as they were in 2007. <laughs> I want you to think back where they emerged from and what's happened since then in terms of the area. Has it been, has it changed? Has it been developed? Is it pretty much the same way it was before? Because if it's pretty much the same way it was 17 years ago, you'll probably have a comparable number of cicadas. That plays into whether you need to protect your plants or not. We're gonna to get to that a little bit later. So I want you to kind of be thinking about that while we're going along here. How many of you are familiar with degree days? I know you better be. <laughs> no. Okay, I, I bring that up because you see there we have between 500 and 600 degree days. That's the other thing that they determined in Ohio and Kentucky correlated pretty closely with the emergence. Degree days are simply a measure of warmth. So we use a base temperature. You'll notice there it says, for those up front, it says DD and then a subscript 50. That implies a 50 degree threshold temperature. Most of my insects don't really do anything physiologically, developmentally, once it gets below 50 degrees. They just kind of sit there. They're kind of like we are when it's 10 below zero, we don't really want to go outside, all right? So when we have, the way we calculate degree days, I'll move through this pretty quickly, but you basically take the maximum temperature and the minimum temperature for a 24 hour period. You figure the average, so add the two together, divide by two. If the average temperature is 51 degrees or greater, then you accumulate degree days. Now today it was what? Near 70 or better, I think? And I think, I don't know what it's supposed to do tonight, maybe in the 50s, not too cool. So let's just say 70 and 50. 70 high, 50 low tonight. This 24 hour period is 120 by two is 60. 60 minus 50, we picked up 10 degree days today. Wow, that's a, I love that kind of reaction. <laughs> I used to teach math at the community college level and it was like, I sure didn't hear that. It was like, ugh. <laughs> math again, that four letter word. All right. You do that each day and you start accumulating. It's a cumulative total. Now normally we start that March 1 in a given year. This year we had such a warm February, we probably picked up a few degree days even in February this year. So with, if this, trend continues, we may have to back it up to January 1, doing our, our math. But anyway, each day you add those together. So when we say 500 to 600, we've accumulated that much warmth, if you will. 
all right? Now plants, you can usually use the uh, 32 or 40 degrees as your base temperature because they start doing things a little bit earlier than the insects do. But that's what degree days are all about. And I think right now we're pushing 100, at least in this area. Now just to give you some perspective on that, and I don't mean to steal Mike's thunder here. Spongy moth eggs typically hatch between 100 and 200 degree days. Base 50. We're already at 100, and we're only in the first couple of weeks of April. Usually we look, and I say usually, we look at mid-May, early to mid-May, even sometimes late May before we see egg hatch. That's how far ahead we are in terms of degree days. And as I tell people, your calendar is only good for your social life. Doesn't, not going to help you with pests or anything we've talked about here because every year is different. Everything's on a different schedule. The day of the year, of course, is just numbering from January 1. Okay, cicadas have a, what we call a gradual or incomplete development. Eggs are going to be laid this summer by the females. Those eggs are going to hatch into nymphs or what we call immatures. They are going to look very similar to the adult. They're going to feed basically the same way. In fact, they're going to drop to the ground and spend the next 17 years there. Okay. All right. And in 2041, they'll be back again. Whether I'll be here or not, that's another story, but they will be. The nymph right here, you can see this is the one we normally see with the annual. It's the same body structure. That's the immature. This is, of course, the adult. Bright red, egg, or bright red eyes, burnt orange wings, jet black, shiny black bodies. Now, normally we don't use color too much with insects because it's too variable, but in this case, that'll work. They're pretty color-coded. They're going to be about half to two-thirds the size of the annual. But the real clincher here is these guys are going to be out early, right? Mayish. Your annuals are out later in the summer. So just the timing alone will tell you which ones they are. So adults will emerge. They have two things on their mind, and I think we're all adults here, so we can handle this. Get acquainted, make babies. Any questions? <laughs> Thought so. Okay, good. That's, that's their priorities, because the a given adult's only going to last, live maybe a few weeks, and then they die. But we're going to have a moment of silence. No. <laughs> During that time, they're going to mate. Females are going to lay the eggs, and they are going to cut these what we call slits or openings in twigs and branches to lay the eggs. Now that's where the real, if you want to call it damage, occurs, and we'll talk about that. Uh, they do a little bit of feeding, but that's very minimal. It's the egg laying that gets everyone's attention. Whoop, moved ahead of myself here. So the eggs are going to be laid in there nice and neatly. All right, those eggs are going to hatch. Now the nymphs have two choices. They can either once the eggs hatch, those nymphs can stay in that twig or branch until it breaks off and drops to the ground, kind of ride it down. Or if you see a lot of little teeny weeny parachutes, <laughs> that's bug humor. Bug humor, okay? Bug humor. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, absolutely. They'll either drop to the ground or they'll ride the twig. But that, you probably won't even see that process because they're so tiny. You won't even notice them. They burrow into the ground, 17 years. On larger mature trees, plants, you're going to see a little bit of flagging. Uh, we call it flagging. You may have heard this relative to Dutch elm disease, oak wilt, some of these pathogens that affect some of our trees. Just don't be alarmed by that because that's probably going to be very common if you're in a cicada area, if it's, they've emerged. Uh, because what they're going to do is those twigs are going to break off, they're going to die, and then they're going to snap off. Now, we have twig girdlers. We have insects that actually girdle the twig, and they'll snap off. They're a completely different insect. I don't know about you all, but I have some really squirrely squirrels in my neighborhood, and they chew on everything. All right. So there may be some of that as well. But if it's fairly consistent throughout the canopy of the tree, that's more than likely cicada damage. 
Again, it's just a natural pruning. We don't worry about it on mature plants. It's not a big deal. Where it will become an issue possibly is on some of your smaller plants and shrubs. Okay, as I mentioned, the adult feeding is minimal. The females have a saw-like ovipositor. Literally cuts a slit or opening in that twig or branch. Pretty amazing that they can do that, all right? They'll lay about 20 eggs in each of these egg nests, and they can lay up to 600 eggs. Pretty impressive. But they also have to do that to ensure that some of them survive, right? Because there's going to be a lot of things out there that are going to take them out. So they have to make sure they have plenty of offspring just like the mosquitoes and all those other varmints. All right, it will take about six to 10 weeks for those eggs to hatch. So if we're talking mid to late May, we're talking mid-July for egg hatch. Of course, the adults will have died off by probably middle, latter part of June, depending on when they emerge. And as I mentioned, then the nymphs will crawl down into the soil and spend the rest of their time there. Both of them, both the Adults and the immatures have a piercing sucking mouth part, so they are sap feeders. Again, the adults will only feed for a very short period of time. The nymphs, of course, are going to feed all that time they're underground on the fine roots and absorbing roots of trees and, and shrubs and such like that. The other big question I get is what plants are going to be affected? Entomologically, we consider cicadas generalists. Wide host range, wide diet, so forth. We have other insects that are very picky. They only eat one or two things or feed on a very small group of plants, maybe within a genus, all right? Preferred hosts, apple, hickory, maple, oaks. Those are preferred. If they're not around, They'll look at things like birch, dogwood, walnut, willow, lindens, and elms. So as you can see, they're not real picky. All right, now, if you don't have any plants on that list yet, hang on. <laughs> I don't want you to feel left out. All right. The exotic ornamentals. Rose, rose family, Cotoneaster, Forsythia, Ginkgo biloba, the ginkgo, and uh, your pear and your lilacs. Those are all possibilities as well on the exotic side. If you have primarily conifers, evergreens, sumac, they're not going to be nearly as preferred. The sap in all your conifers kind of, no pun intended here, kind of gums everything up. When the eggs go to hatch, a lot of them can't escape that resin and, and sticky, gooey material. Also, your prunus, which are peach, plum, and cherry, you know, they also have that gummy gummosis, as we call it, a lot of times along the trunk and some of the branches. Um, also, your uh, persimmon, they don't prefer those as well either because of the, for the, all the gummosis. makes it very difficult for the egg laying and for the uh, nymphs to emerge. So as I mentioned, on mature trees, it's going to be natural pruning. Where the rub comes in is on younger plants, and shrubs. Now, the critical diameter based on work we did back in 1990 at the Arboretum and, and many other studies as well is uh, twigs or stems between about an eighth of an inch and, a, and just short of a half inch are pretty prime egg laying sites. All right? So if you have some, I know in my neighborhood we've got some very young pinky thumb sized little bur oaks that they planted after a tornado went through. They would be prime targets for the stem, the trunk, if you will. On your shrubs, if you have shrubs at that, of that diameter, you may see egg laying on those as well. Now again, it gets back to what happened 17 years ago, right? If you didn't have any cicadas 17 years ago, chances are you're not going to have any this time either. Anybody fit into that category? No one? Oh, uh, come on, come on. Not in Riverside. Not in Riverside, yeah. Your older neighborhoods where the homes were built years ago. If you're in an area where it was a cornfield 17 years ago and they've developed it, you probably won't see any. So I just want to make sure because if you, 
didn't have any last time, we'd be glad to share them with you. <laughs> but keep that one eighth to right at a half inch. Now, on large plants, trees, and, and large shrubs, again, that's going to be the natural pruning. But if you have some little whips, we had uh, some elm and maple whips at the Arboretum in 1990, and they worked those over pretty well. In fact, they had to cut them back and let them regrow after the cicadas were gone. Uh, some of your smaller shrubs, you may see some egg laying out on the tips. Now, one of the things we're going to look at, since the last time we did our survey was in 1990 at the Arboretum, we're going to go back and do another one this year. I haven't told my interns that yet. But we're going to see, first of all, how extensive it is. Of course, there's been a lot of plants added to the Arboretum in the last 34 years. So it'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out. You might think that with these, literally millions of these insects out there feeding on the roots of trees, that they might have some long-term effect. There's been no evidence of that. A few studies have looked at this. Oh, maybe a slight reduction in health of the tree for a few years, but then they come right back. And if you think about it, that feeding is spread out over 17 years anyway. It's not like all at once. So very manageable for tree, uh, trees and plants that are healthy uh, for the most part. We did a study, we looked at uh, around 140 different uh, groups of plants at the ARB, uh, both exotic and natives. They did a, stu a study in Delaware as well a few years back. They found a slight difference, slight preference for the non-natives or exotics. We didn't find really any significant difference. So like I said, they're not real picky. They'll go after uh, native plants as well as, as uh, exotics. One thing though that we're going to look at pretty closely, and I've read this in the literature, is plant architecture. If you have a really bushy shrub, lots of stems, full shrub, you may see more egg slits or egg nests overall, but they'll probably be fewer per stem because they've been diluted or spread out. If you have a, a shrub or a plant that uh, is fairly coarse in its growth habit, fewer stems and you may see more per per individual stem. But we're going to kind of look at that and see if that play, uh, holds up as well. But that's one thing they've noticed. I mentioned conifers, hemlocks, junipers, arborvitaes use. You may see a little bit of attempt to lay eggs there because those twigs and branches are a little more flexible. And you don't have the needles like you have on a spruce that wrap around the entire twig. If you've ever grabbed a Colorado blue spruce, you know it's pretty prickly. Be like kind of cozy up to a porcupine, all right? So those particular uh, plants will not probably see any uh, damage at all, but some of the more flexible uh, ones that have more of the scale type leaf and thing, or flatter leaves, they may see a little bit. Black walnut, Osage orange, they have a pithy, uh, spongy pith uh, in the center of the stem or, or branch, so they're not going to—they're not very suitable either because of drying out of the eggs and so forth. Mm -hmm. Tree of Heaven, Kentucky coffee tree, your sumacs—they uh, have very thick, stout stems, usually at least three eighths of an inch in diameter. Very little damage there. However, one thing that was interesting—we noticed in 1990. If you're familiar with the Kentucky coffee tree, it has a great big bipinnately compound leaf. The rachis which is the part, the bottom base part of the leaf where it attaches to the stem, is about an eighth of an inch in diameter. And we actually found areas there where the cicada tried to lay eggs in that rachis. So it's like the eighth of an inch is the key. That's the key diameter for them. But if they're uh, too stiff or too stout, uh, they tend to leave them alone. One study they used, uh, they looked at light. Uh, Apparently, some of the uh, plants were more out in the open, were more attractive. Now, we saw this similar type thing with emerald ash borer. Ash trees that were out in full sun seemed to be a little more attractive to the insect or were easier to find than trees that were kind of hidden or mixed in uh, in a wooded area. But this is just one study indicating they might have used, might use solar. I don't know. I don't think they use the eclipse as an indicator, though. All right. As we said, there are really no significant effects from the uh, nymphs feeding. One study where they looked at a variety of different trees, found a little bit of reduction, 
the year after the emergence, and then another one, a uh, uh, little bit uh, increase in growth five years after. But again, that's uh, a function of the overall health of the plant as well. If the plant is struggling, then that's going to be a little harder for it to recover. So we really don't worry about that too much. So in 1990, we looked at 140 exotic and native plant genera at the Arboretum. Uh, we also looked at about 14 different urban parkway tree species. Bottom line, uh, most of the plants healed over within one to two years, calloused over the wounds, all right? Some took a little longer, alder, lilac, hackberry, some of the oaks, the uh, lindens, honey locusts, some of those took a little bit longer uh, to heal up, but we didn't see any major impact on the plants. Now, what you have to understand, this is very disappointing for an entomologist or a pathologist, because we're always looking for problems. We're gloom and doom. Okay? We're gloom and doom. But nothing happened. No diseases showed up on the wounds, no insect issues. So it was kind of a, okay, that's a good thing, but it was kind of disappointing. We were looking for something exciting. I know for you that was a, a blessing there that we did. So how are we going to deal with this event? First of all, I want you to enjoy it. It's a unique biological event. Longest life cycle of any insect we know about. The adults will only be out for two or three weeks, maybe four at the most, so enjoy it. You have children, grandchildren, get them out there, expose it to them. Let them see what's going on. This is the only time we entomologists get any positive press. <laughs> it takes 17 years every time, all right? The rest of the time it's EAB, spongy moth, whatever, okay? Yes, yes. If you can, if you can hold off, if you've got plans to plant some plant, woody plants, really small material, if you can hold off till after the emergence or even into the fall, that should be fine. Now, if you've already got, I know I've talked to people and they've already got their plants ordered. I was with a group last week. They're going to have a lilac sale. You, you wonder how I got out of that room alive, right? <laughs> Yeah, so if you can put it off, that would be ideal, but I know in some cases that's not possible, particularly with the industry, landscape and nursery industry. You can cover the plants with netting. If you Again, that goes back to knowing what happened historically, all right, and how severe it was. Uh, from what I understand, most of the... Uh, Hobby Lobby and other stores have sold out, so you may have to go to Amazon or on the, uh, online to get the netting. But it needs to be a small enough mesh so they can't get through it. So if you're using mesh to keep birds off your garden or your f small fruits or whatever, that's going to be too, probably too large. They'll go right through that. So if you want to wrap your trees, best way is just to basically dra drape it over and wrap it and gather it at the bottom as close to the soil as you can on small trees or shrubs, all right? I have a, a colleague that's down in the war zone, Petersburg area, that he's got a, a, a very unique oak uh, arboretum. He's got a lot of young oaks out there. There's no way he can net all of them, so he's going to at least try to protect the leaders so they don't damage those and take his chances on everything else. But that's what we're recommending on that. Um, but please take the netting off when it's all over. Don't leave it on. All right? I know that sounds silly, but you'd be surprised. And we have people that plant plants in plastic pots, and they don't take them out of the pot. That's the truth. That's the truth. We're not recommending, I say we, the Arboretum, and myself professionally, we're not recommending any insecticide, number one. Not effective. We tried it in 1990. It didn't have any impact. They did work in Maryland again in 20. It didn't have any impact. Really didn't affect anything. Plus, you had the risk of all the collateral damage, all your beneficials. Uh, the adult females landed on the plants that were sprayed, didn't phase them. It didn't affect egg hatch. So we're not recommending any of that at all. Uh, it's not practical on a large scale. And we, it's just, like I said, a lot of collateral damage there. All right. Any questions? Well, we said you're oh, going yeah, to take some written questions. 
Pardon me? Oh, yeah. So I'm going to move on to, if you want to have some questions on um, periodical cicada, feel free to write those down if I didn't, if I missed something. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to spongy moth. How deep do they go? Pardon me? How deep? Good question. Um, most of your tree roots, your fine absorbing roots, are usually in that top 18 to 24 inches. So I'm going to say just based on that, that's probably going to be in that range. Uh, but they are, of course, working their way to the surface. But, um, and we're using the 8-inch depth as our measure for soil temperature. So, yeah, foot, foot and a half, probably. They, I, don't, I really don't believe most soil-dwelling insects don't migrate a lot either horizontally and not too much vertically. Japanese beetle grubs, for instance, may move a little bit up and down vertically, but yeah, they, once they get there, they pretty much stay put. All right, spongy. Oh. Mind if I just make a few? No, go right here. ahead. So I, I just wanted to share with the group. I've already been starting to get phone calls about the cicada, of course, and, and panic over the damage done. I just want to sort of reassure you all that in my first round with the cicada here in Riverside, I do not recall losing a single tree in the way of mortality. Now, you know, the tree dying from these oviposits and such. Um, I did see some of the branch flagging that you discussed, um, but overall, I think for the most part, it's something that, you know, I agree with, with Frederick. We should be enjoying this. You know, I mean, to me, this is a really neat experience. Um, in Riverside, it's a pretty amazing experience. For those of you who missed the last round 17 years ago, you're in for a fun ride. A great time. Yes, yes. It's, I mean, to me, it's amazing. I mean, there's tree trunks that are basically moving at some point. So uh, you're going to be uh, really enjoying this. But um, I do share, and I've gotten some calls. So what I've been telling people is if you are inclined, like if you received a parkway tree from us over the past couple of years, really the key thing is protecting the top portion of the plant. Fred mentioned the leader, central leader, mainly the main stem that grows upward. Um, if you think of it from the perspective of looking out the window, uh, we've got some giant historic pre-settlement bur oaks, white oaks over in Guthrie Park. You notice there's no lower limbs on those. They've shedded them over time or we've pruned them. So if you think of the lower limbs on a smaller parkway tree, those limbs are all going to be removed over time. So really, if you lose a branch here and there or you have that flagging, those are really, from an arborist standpoint, a, a temporary branch. We're holding on to those while the tree is putting energy uh, from photosynthesis. So ultimately, those branches will be removed. So I don't think you need to be incredibly worried, but I do recommend pro protecting that central growing point on the tree um, if you can. We have uh, over 900 trees that are two inches and smaller in our tree inventory. So from the village's standpoint, it would be impossible to protect them all. So we are basically going to let it ride with one exception. Uh, and this is what causes foresters to drink at night. Um, so I often joke that mother nature manages me more than I manage it as a forester. And you know, one thing I would share, we've been working on this project in 2017. I collected a bunch of acorns um, from around the river. They're all pre-settlement oaks, essentially, and I gave them to a nursery to contractually grow, right? Um, of course, the nursery calls me this January. I'm thinking I'm all smart, right? Like, I'm not going to plant. I'm going to wait till fall. Good recommendation, Frederick. I'm smart, right? No. The nursery calls me and they say, well, at least 35 of these 87 trees are starting to get tight in the root bag. You're going to have to plant them this spring. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't sleep very well for about a week trying to come to grips with this, but I am going to do the netting experience uh, with all of you as fun homeowners. Uh, even though I, my best laid plans were to avoid this issue, <laughs> sometimes Mother Nature makes me do things I don't want to do. Um, as, as all of us. But anyway, yeah. I just wanted to share yeah, that. And also, yeah. a huge shout out to the Frederick Law Olmstead Society. They have been key partners in the donation of these worth trees. We're going to be planting some this Saturday with Riverside Brookfield as part of their day of service along Blooming Bank Road. So with that, I will pass it back over right. to Frederick. Thank you. Just to reiterate the idea of enjoying. 
A lot of people, I've talked to people literally that are going to stay in their house the whole month of June. That's going to be a long month. <laughs> and other people will feel like the world's coming to an end. But I do have to share one story with you. Actually, two. In 1990, when it came out, my wife, future wife, was living in California. So she came back to here for a short visit right in the middle of the emergence. <laughs> And uh, I thought, you know, this will be a good test. We'll see if she really wants to marry an entomologist. <laughs> she handled it quite well. 33 years later, we're still good. She was staying with some friends in Western Springs. So we were walking around at night. And of course, all the cicadas were beginning to die and lay along the sidewalk and all this kind of stuff. But on the way to the airport to get her, I was over here on 55th Street. I'll never forget. I had stopped at a stoplight. It was kind of a warm day. I had the AC going. Of course, I could, windows up, I could hear the cicadas. And I came to a red light, and I looked over to my left, and there's this young man sitting in his car at the light with me in the other lane. Both windows were down, but the cicadas were flying through his car. <laughs> Again, being warped, uh, I was laughing my head off. This was hilarious. <laughs> Just watching these like this, you know, his head was going back and forth. And the minute that light changed, he was gone. <laughs> so anyway, that's the if that's the worst thing that happens to you, you're good. All right, spongy moth, this used to be known as gypsy moth. I learned it that way for 40 some odd years. Now they've changed it, but whatever. It's known now as spongy moth. This is one that's been around since the late 1860s, came over here right after the Civil War. Major pest even today of a lot of our forest trees and urban trees. Unfortunately, its preferred host is oak. It does have many different hosts several hundred, but it really likes oaks for some reason. This is the one that overwinters as an egg mass. Mike and I were out back in January, one of those nice, after the week of winter that we had, or actually mm -hmm. just before the week of winter. Actually. Yes. Yeah. Uh, looking out right over here in your area that you're going to be uh, treating and found, you know, some egg masses. But these are the, what they're going to look like. They're going to be kind of a circular, oblong shaped, kind of a dark brown to tannish brown blotch on the tree on the bark or the in the bark cracks and crevices and that's the eggs from last year that the female laid those eggs like i said usually hatch between 100 and 200 degree days base 50 so we would expect them to be hatching here pretty shortly egg mass up there at about 11 o'clock larvae then pop out and initially they're going to be kind of just your standard black looking little caterpillars are very hairy as they get uh, older they develop the uh, six pairs of red dots and four pairs of blue, so it makes it nice. They're color-coded. That way you can tell them. After a few weeks of feeding, then they're going to pupate, turn into a pupa, and that's when they do this massive transformation. Still haven't gotten my head around it after 40 years of studying insects. They go from an insect that has chewing mouth parts, no wings, crawls, to an insect that flies, has a siphoning mouth part, all that in that pupil stage. Now we call it the quiescent stage, but it, externally, yes, but internally massive changes are going on. Their digestive system, their morphology, everything. It's pretty amazing. Adults will be out. Females are white in color. They are not able to fly, okay? Males are darker and brown. They will mate. Female will lay the eggs, those eggs will, and that's usually along about mid to late July. Those eggs will sit there then, clear around to the following May, even though it's still summer, all right? Both the adults will die off then, and uh, the eggs will overwinter. So I mentioned the larvae, that's what they're gonna look like when they're young. You can see then they change color pretty quickly. Anybody been up, lived up in the New England area, northeast, when they've had big outbreaks up there, anyone? So you know what I'm talking about, right? It's raining. We call it frass. In my profession, it's called frass. That's a mixture of insect poop and plant material. So it literally rains. The, well, that's, you know, a little awkward when you're sitting on your deck and you're having food and all, you're getting a little extra protein that way. Yes. Now that's a little more gross bug humor, but it's still bug humor, okay? <laughs> hey, it's protein. The other, pardon me? Yeah. I said, hey, it's protein. It's really. protein, man. The other uh, 
aspect of this, though, that's usually more serious. People do de uh, can develop respiratory diseases, allergens, because of the, they're very hairy. So when they shed their skins, then people can have some allergic reactions to that. But it can be uh, pretty heavy in that respect. So there's the female. Again, she is not able to fly. That egg mass is how they get moved around. Now think about it. This insect first started in Massachusetts. The female that lays the eggs can't fly. So how do you think it got clear out here? Us, humans. Those egg masses get laid on a camper trailer, a boat trailer, a kid's play set, whatever. Oh, we just got transferred to Chicago and they lived in Boston. You see what I mean? That's how it gets, just like with emerald ash borer, we're gonna see the same thing with spongy mo or uh, spotted lanternfly. I love this picture. If you can't see it in the back, there are people perched up in these trees scraping off egg masses. <laughs> now, I think you're in that picture someplace. No. Yeah, right. No. <laughs> That's how they used to do it. OSHA would have a field day with that, right? They're not tied in. They got ladders. They're just sitting up there on those branches. Amazing what we used to do. And we're still here. But That's how they used to, to do the egg mass business. All right. <laughs> In our infinite human wisdom, we discovered after a while we're not going to stop the movement of spongy moth. Just like we discovered we're not going to stop the spread of EAB, Emerald Ash Borer. Okay? So they decided we're going to do a slow the spread program, and Mike's going to uh, elaborate on that. I'll hit it very, very briefly, but he's going to talk about relation related to your old community here. I want you to think of it kind of like fighting a, a grass fire or forest fire. You've got the main front of the fire moving through an area, okay? But out front of that, you have spot fires. And so we do survey work every year. Uh, these pheromone traps, there's a pheromone inside of these little delta traps, or the, what we call our milk carton traps, that makes the male think that there's a female there. Man, is he in for a surprise. Because inside those traps is this real sticky, gooey, tanglefoot-like stuff. It just ruins his whole day. Okay? But we use that to monitor for the males because, again, the females don't fly. So I know this is hard to see in the back, but if you can think about if we did nothing at all, didn't attempt to stop this insect at all, it would be by 2030, it would be basically practically clear through Illinois, just a small tip of southern Illinois. Whoop, I've got it. I'm not used to this uh, smart board. It would be pretty much through Illinois, clear down into the southeast and beginning to, and pretty much have gone through, beginning to approach Missouri. The point is it would have been very devastating. If you know anything about southern Missouri, southern Illinois, northern Arkansas, lots of oaks, big part of the forest system down there. So by implementing a slow the spread program, even as late as 2030, we're still way up here in northeastern Illinois. So it is working both economically and pest management wise. So that's what we call slow the spread. You may read, if you want to read more about it, it's quite an interesting program. We still have some counties way up here in northeastern Illinois, uh, Lake and Cook, DuPage, I think LaSalle's been the one most recently added, that are quarantined. We're monitoring those very closely, but we put traps out ahead of that front and when we find a uh, high enough population of males, then we do some aerial treatments. So that's what we mean by slow the spread. I'll leave that to Mike to explain the rest of that. So this last year, they had quite an influx of males, large numbers from the previous year. So they went back and looked at some of the weather patterns and the area that really got hit hard with lots of males was up here in northwest Illinois. Hmm. They also had a similar experience up in uh, southwestern Wisconsin, so we could blame it on them, all right? And northeastern Iowa also had a similar experience that we had. And people are scratching their head because the insects shouldn't be moving northeast to southwest. All of our prevailing winds in the summer, spring and summer are, are which direction? west and southwest, right? So we actually should have been blowing them up into Wisconsin. 
But they went back and looked at the weather records for this last year, and there was a unique weather event where the winds mm -hmm. actually shifted and were blowing northeast to southwest. And so we think that's how a lot of these males found their way down into our area. We call that a blow-in. Not a blow-off, but a blow-in. <laughs> All right, so we'll see. This summer will tell the story whether we have an infestation going or they're just a bunch of males that got caught in that wind event and got blown into Illinois. But that's how weather can really impact things. All right, I just covered that. Uh, Management-wise, and Mike's going to elaborate on this, we, they usually use the pheromone flakes, which are little teeny weeny, um, what, fiberglass, I think, or something related to that. That's they, they used to be flakes, but flakes. I think they've pivoted to something okay. else now. But they're impregnated with the pheromone. I mentioned that males and females communicate by pheromones, chemicals, sex pheromones. So the female goes off the sex pheromone, the male, that's how they find each other. All right. These pheromone flakes are impregnated with the, the female's pheromone, and so when they drop this over a large area, I like to use the analogy, it's like if your significant other had a particular type of perfume that they, or cologne that they wore, and we took, put you into a room, blindfolded you, and all the people in the room all wore the, had the same cologne or perfume, and you had to find your significant other. That's what we're, we're trying to flood the area with the, the chemical. Not too many of you are smiling. That's <laughs> so we're trying to saturate the area so that the males and females can't find each other. Okay. BT is another approach, uh, usually helicopter or can be fixed wing, depending on um, the choice there. But again, Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a bacteria uh, specific to moths and butter, or but if, uh, moths in particular, like, like spongy moth, Easter caterpillar and all those, but it's very specific to those and uh, is a good way to apply it aerially as opposed to going in with a really harsh uh, insecticide. Okay. Um, also, we've done some work. I used to, uh, when Dr. George Wehr was with us, he and I did a lot of work. We kind of had this joke going, he provided the trees, I provided the critters. So we do these preference studies to see which uh, types of plants were preferred by some of these. I've just thrown in a few examples. Again, more of an idea of what is a possibilities out there if you are replacing plants, uh, trees in particular. There's some of the hornbeams uh, that appear to be less susceptible. They're not resistant, less, just less susceptible to things like Japanese beetle and smudgy moth. So there's a few of those that are out there available if you're wanting to look at those as replacements. Whoop. And then uh, on the elm side, a lot of these, of course, were ones that Dr. Ware developed with his work. You can see quite a few of the hybrid elms that we have out there not only are, are uh, less susceptible to JBs and spongy moth, but also D Dutch elm disease and some of the other maladies that they, uh, the American elm has suffered from. So Zilkova is one I find that thinks really got good possibilities. So these are just some uh, suggestions out there that we uh, I've been able to, to work out. Some are in the industry. A lot of them, actually, a lot of these are out there in the industry, in the nursery industry. So, okay. All right. Mike's going to come on and talk to you about specific that. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's a tough act to follow. Oh. Fred, yeah. Frederick knows his stuff. Uh, so, it, you know, and actually, Frederick invited me tonight just saying, why don't we pony in uh, the, the spongy moth situation in Riverside? So, I'm really honored to be included oh, because well. Fred was my boss. You know, I worked <laughs> for him at the Morton Arboretum. He was on my master's committee. So, it's, it's just really neat to partner with him. And I appreciate the invite. You're welcome. Um, I won't waste any time here. I wonder if I can. Nope. Don't do that. <laughs> oh, God. Say what? Uh, there we go. All right. Going the wrong way. OK, now we're off and running. So I figured I'd start by just reviewing some of the history with spongy moth in Riverside. When I actually got here in 2004, I did note that we did have an infestation in Scottswood Common, which makes a lot of sense when you think of it. That's probably some of our most dense oak population. And that's the preferred host of spongy moth. Uh, back then, it was called Gypsy Moth, which, you know, you know you've been doing this a long time when they're changing the name of things on you. Uh, 
So it's kind of been an adjustment. So if I accidentally say gypsy moth, I mean no offense. Um, so, and actually what I read was an entomologist, I'm just gonna put these all up. An entomologist was a part of that. I, at first I thought it was more of a politically correct thing, but um, apparently an entomologist spearheaded this because mm -hmm. of the spongy egg mass texture. If you've ever seen one, they're very, they're probably about an inch, inch and a half long sort of tan buff. You notice I keep looking at Frederick to make sure I'm saying the right things here. Um, but anyway, so in 2005, I sort of hit the ground running and started reaching out to the Illinois Department of Agriculture. Um, this obviously was very concerning to me, especially being that 20% of our tree inventory, public tree inventory, is in oak species. So this could be potentially devastating for Riverside and its oak population. Um, so I, I sort of hit the ground running and started doing all sorts of things. Uh, we did moth trapping, which Frederick mentioned, uh, the pheromone trapping and that approach. You can see the, the uh, delta trap and, and milk carton trap. Uh, those uh, experiences counting the moths in those traps are quite uh, harrowing. It's sort of, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of everything in there. It's not just the moth. You have like, <laughs> You know, it, it, I don't even want to get into that. But, um, you know, the other thing I found humorous that I found really endearing to Riverside is I, I started doing this tree banding in Scottswood Common, which is really not the most effective way to manage uh, spongy moth. But I thought it was really funny because the community started referring to them as tree skirts because you would take burlap, tie a, a string around it, fold it down, and since spongy moth will feed in the canopy and then go down on the trunk to hide predation, uh, basically they'll go to these little skirted areas and hang out. And then what you do essentially is come there in the morning while they're still sleeping, get some soapy water, stick them in there and watch them scream. Um, <laughs> revenge, you know. Um, but either way, that's kind of tree geeky stuff. Um, so in 2006, after 2005, I had noted that the uh, defoliation that was taking place was fairly notable. We had collaboration with IDA in the way of the, the moth counts, and we were able to show that there was a decent population. And then I also kind of said, hey, you know, Judy Bart Pinka where, you know, lives in Riverside, and, you know, kind of did a little bit of that massaging. And long story short, we basically collaborated for two aerial sprays of BTK. That's the Bacillus thuringiensis christachii. It's a bacterium, and essentially, if you do gardening, you've been exposed to this. It's a natural occurring bacterium in the soil, very specific to caterpillars. Uh, basically, what happens is if, if it feeds on a leaf, uh, its guts basically explode if it's been coated with BTK. So mission accomplished. That's how you knock, knock the population down. Um, we, so in this collaboration, they did those two sprays. You can see about 587 acres between Lyons and Riverside. Uh, there's also a little blurb over there by Salt Creek, I think in LaGrange Park, but you'll note that the focus was on the river corridor, and that's a lot how these insects tend to blow in and move around. Um, so that was a big focus. Almost the entire first division was sprayed twice, and that was in May. And then they also did a pheromone flake drop in late June, uh, early July, and that's just to confuse the mating. Um, so that effectively helped knock that population down. Um, and then the next, well, in 2007 and eight, essentially I was doing a lot of evaluating, monitoring for defoliation. We continued trapping and turning those into IDA. Um, and then 2009 I did find from, well, sorry, previous year, 08, we noted some significant defoliation in a few spots. So we did some spot spraying with Davy tree experts from the ground. And these were in very small localized areas. Um, and that essentially got us to 2023. Um, so kind of funny, actually. I got a call um, uh, from a resident in Scottswood Common or adjacent, I think, um, uh, Christine Anderson, you in the house by chance? No? Yes? No? Anyway, shout outs to her. She gave me a call and said, I think there's a bunch of spongy moths flying around in Scottswood Common. And I said, what the hell is a spongy moth? 
uh, you know, I was so used to gypsy moth. But anyway, long story short, I went out there. I said, oh, I know exactly what this is. And I mean, there is extremely heavy moth activity. Uh, you could not miss it. It was, they were all over the place. The males mainly, the females don't fly. Um, and one thing that was really concerning is when I was evaluating all of the trees, there were all four uh, stages of the life cycle present, meaning the pupa, larvae, um, caterpillar, moth. So uh, immediately I called the Illinois Department of Ag, let them know, you know what I was seeing. And um, you know Scott Shermer, who's actually, uh, his parents are a Riverside resident on Nut All. He's been a tremendous help, and he grew up in Riverside. Um, he sort of uh, explained to me that if you're seeing all four of the life cycles, it's been there for a little while, and it would definitely warrant some control. Um, so that, that kind of snapped things into action. I, I did present to the board. I don't know if anyone saw that presentation, but um, in essence, uh, we uh, collaborated with the board, and I got approval generally to move forward with the potential spray, which we will be doing, and I'll get into that. Um, but first we started by doing a winter egg mass survey. You can see the picture all the way at the bottom is Scottswood Common, and the area in red are areas where I was actually finding egg masses. In fact, I believe uh, 112 Scottswood to be sort of a ground zero for this. Uh, based on our evaluation and all the egg masses that we're seeing. In fact, Frederick came out and harvested some of the egg masses. Are those growing yet? They're still in my fridge. Ah, okay. Yeah. Right. Anyway, Riverside spongy moth. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, They'll the, definitely get credit. Yeah. The, the gift that keeps on giving. Yes. Um, anyway, so we controlled a few of them that way, but unfortunately there's uh, quite a few egg masses on the undersides of the branching. So um, with the board's approval, we have sort of, well, and I should also st thank Scott Shermer as well. He also came out and he supported us at the board level while we were discussing some of these options and sort of walked me through some of his opinions. But the long story short, you can see in the bottom that winter egg mass survey in red where we are finding these egg masses. And then the picture to the top is essentially the proposed treatment area for this spring. Now, to Fred's, Frederick's point earlier, um, you know, the season's moving a little faster and we're a little warmer than we're used to. So I've been talking with the Illinois Department of Ag and the helicopter service that we'll be engaging with. Um, they're going to have a meeting on the 15th. You know, obviously we're all a little concerned that things could jump out ahead of us pretty quickly. Uh, but one thing I would point out, you know, it's about a 31 acre treatment area. Um, cost of this for two aerial sprays of BTK is going to be just under four, 14K, 14,000. Um, but what we did is established an area that's going to have sort of a buffer. So there's what we're seeing in the way of egg masses, and then there's also the potential for sort of an outlier or something that pops out ahead. Um, so we're proposing a little bit wider swath than where we're just seeing the egg masses. So. Um, that's in essence what we're going to do and then following that I'll be monitoring for defoliation in the spring and then after that I'll also be trapping moths in collaboration with IDA just to monitor the population. Our hope is that this treatment will knock things down and God willing I won't have to deal with this for another 15 years or so. However, Mother Nature you know, she has her own way, and I just, like I said, I get managed by nature more than I manage it. Don't tell my employers that, though. Um, so I guess, you know, I would just wrap things up by saying that, you know, this is a really challenging insect. Frederick had mentioned the damage that it's done. Um, you know, my goal is just to mitigate it. I think there's potential that we could have some defoliation, but the idea is to monitor and make sure that our pre-settlement oaks are protected for the future. You know, my larger concern is with some of the recent droughts um, and also being urban trees out in a turf setting. Uh, they're under a little bit more stress than, you know, an average forest tree. So I just think it's important to be very proactive when it comes to this issue. And that's the approach that we're essentially going to take. Um, beyond that, um, I could certainly pass it back to Frederick for spotted lanternfly. Um, I don't know if anyone had any immediate questions, concerns.
much. Go ahead. Can I could you restate your question? I just wonder, you talk about explaining, and I, I agree, Gypsy Mark from Fungi Mark from is, is ugly and damaging. But with the spraying, does that affect the bird population? No, it's, it's very specific to caterpillars, and the common concern are, are monarchs, you know, thinking of butterflies and that angle. The good news is that generally the monarch hatch and those caterpillars typically do not coincide with the, um, the spongy moth caterpillars. They're pretty far out ahead. And then the other part of it, really, and the native caterpillars are the primary concern. The bird population will not be affected. Um, but you know, one thing that you have to be conscious of too is if we do not control the spongy moth, that'll be a direct competitor with a lot of our native caterpillars. Uh, it's my understanding in speaking with um, IDA that, you know, and this is certainly a concern of mine too, that if we were not to treat and if that population were to build, it would actually push out a lot of the native caterpillars and Lepidoptera. So, uh, you know, it's, it's important to be proactive on these things, but, um, you know, I'm really not very concerned with the bird population. One thing I am concerned about, though, and I would say this, and if you want to police your neighbors, you're more than welcome. You know, one theory I could have about this situation is that this spongy moth event could have likely been brought in with firewood. Um, and that's actually uh, a lot of means of ways that things can be transported. Like, let's say you have a lake house up in Michigan or in Wisconsin. Uh, if you're shuttling that firewood, back to Riverside, you could also be bringing a pest along with it, whether it's spotted lanternfly or spongy moth. Mm -hmm. Emerald ash borer was also uh, kind of driven a little bit by firewood movement. So that would be one thing I would want to impress to people about uh, being conscious about moving firewood. Okay. Uh, my apologies, I was off on the side. I haven't heard the whole thing. Um, but you were asking about questions. Um, when it comes to gypsy moths and some of your more destructive, irritable um, cicadas and such, is anyone looking into, are you guys considering or keeping an eye on, uh, such as the Cas9 CRISPR experiments, they're doing the Florida Keys with mosquitoes. What it is is an all-male gene that gets transferred to the next generation. Essentially what happens is all of the babies are male and they pass that on. So after a few generations, the entire population collapses. No pesticides, no problems, no issues. Um, is that something you guys are familiar with? Could you talk about it a little bit? Are you looking into it? Is anyone else looking into it? Um, the potential is essentially, if it works, um, you've got decent control mm -hmm. with no effort once it establishes itself. I don't know of any, I don't know, yeah, he was talking about genetic manipulation and, and uh, that sort of thing with male, the males and such. They've done it with screwworm flies down on, with cattle in Texas, in Texas, Mexico. Um, it was very effective there. I don't know of any efforts with uh, spongy moth, and to be honest with you, I wouldn't want to do it on the cicadas, because I think that would be tragic to wipe out an insect like that. But. Uh, there are a few of the medically important insects where they do that, where they're trying to, to look at. But you have to make sure that the, I know this sounds a little strange, but you have to make sure that that male who's been altered behaves like a normal male. Because if he doesn't, the females won't have anything to do with it. And since, again, we're all adults here, I think we can understand that, okay? <laughs> so if you get a, a, they do that through various means, it's always tricky that way, plus it takes a lot of funding and you've got to keep it going. But with mosquitoes, yeah, I know they've tried that in a few cases. Right, so nothing immediate. But there nothing are that I'm aware of, no. Okay, thank you, Brent. I'm just going to hit this very quickly because uh, I know we've gone over just a touch. Um, spotted lanternfly, how many of you have heard of that before I passed out the little cards? Good. I, like I kind of call this gyp uh, spongy moth 2.0 for the reasons Mike just mentioned about how insects get moved around. All right. This first showed up in Pennsylvania. They think it got, came in on landscape materials, hardscape materials into to Pennsylvania. It since now has moved to Michigan, Ohio, Iowa, Indiana, and we joined the club last year. We didn't want to be left out. They found an infestation in South Cook County. They're going to, I was just at a meeting last week. They're going to go back and monitor for that again here next week, actually. 
uh, to see what, see if it's, uh, how extensive it is and so forth. But it has been documented here in Illinois. <clears throat> right now we have the egg masses out there that were laid last fall. The, people describe it as kind of looks like mud, dried mud on the, on the trunks and, and uh, of uh, host trees, particularly things like Tree of Heaven, all right, which is very common in uh, along railroad right-of-ways, uh, abandoned fields, places like that. That's what you're likely to see here for a few more weeks. Once those eggs hatch, you're going to have these yeah, somewhat different looking critters out, okay? Reddish uh, nymphs with the white spots. Eventually they'll have, they'll turn black with white spots as they mature. And they'll, they're not nearly as picky about their diet as the adults are. And I'll get to that in just a second. They'll feed pretty much throughout the summer. Then the adults, of course, will come out. It is a plant hopper, very effective plant hopper. They can fly, they have wings, but they're not nearly as, as effective at that as the hopping effect. Um, and both of these life stages, since they have gradual development, they feed on plant sap. So they produce a lot of honeydew. Honeydew is liquid poop. Insect poop. That's probably the nicest way to say it. So if you've ever had your plants infested with aphids, white flies, mealybugs, you know what I'm talking about. That's that sticky, gooey stuff that shows up, or some of your scale insects. That usually follows with uh, a fungus called sooty mold. The plant will look black. The leaves will look black. That's a fungus that feeds off the honeydew. So this is what you're going to uh, encounter. Uh, right now, the Department of Ag is just monitoring this. I don't think it's going to be a huge problem for us in, in most cases. It's not, this is not an EAB thing, all right? It's going to be more of a nuisance. People may go out and sit on their deck, their get up, their deck chair sticks to their bottom, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Or you may go out to get, yeah. You may go out to get in your car, and there's this sticky, stuff all over your windshield and of course then you do to make the fatal mistake of running your windshield wipers and that just makes it worse <laughs> all right but it will feed on it really likes tree of heaven it will feed on walnut willow some of the others out there um, for some reason and we don't totally understand the female really prefers the tree of heaven the adult female now the nymphs like i said feed on a lot of things but the, the adult females really like that tree of heaven that seems to evidently stimulate ovulation and egg laying and all that sort of thing. So that's something we're trying to really keep an eye on. If you have Tree of Heaven in your uh, neighborhood or whatever, you know, keep an eye on it, see if you see any of the immature stages of the adults. Where it is a problem, the insect really likes grapes. So it's turning out to be a real problem in vineyards. And I think uh, some of your tree fruits, I think if it gets into southern Illinois, uh, who was it mentioned? Cobden. Um, somebody, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, down in that area where a lot of the fruit, tree fruits are grown and a lot of your vineyards, and that could be more of an economic problem. I think for us, most homeowners, landscapes, it's just going to be a nursery thing. But I just wanted to alert you to it. You have the little card. Keep an eye out for these. If you do see those, please let us know, and we'd be glad to come out and investigate because we do want to monitor for it. But I don't think they're going to do any widespread treatments or anything like that. So. Do we have any other questions or? We have questions, yes. Okay. Uh, so the uh, first question, oh, sorry. I mean, actually, there's some questions related to your map, so I want to go oh, back okay. to that. Maybe towards um, the front. Yeah. Let me scroll up here. While we're looking here, I should mention the Landscape Advisory Commission threw together a nice FAQ. Uh, on cicada, so yeah. feel free to grab one on the way out if you don't have one already. Looks like some of you do, so. So uh, thank you for filling out the uh, index cards uh, to uh, ask the questions. So according to the map shown um, at the first, um, will there not be a cicada north of uh, the Illinois-Wisconsin line? So that's the first part oh, of the we, question. Oh, did we lose the... Uh, we lost the map. Maybe it's the next one prior to it. Okay, let's see here. No, there will be... Oh, whoops. There we go. There yeah. will be... Uh, 
the emergence of the 17-year uh, in southern Wisconsin. Um, probably kind of in the Madison area and south, down towards the Illinois border. So they'll definitely have some activity up there, northeast Iowa, and in the northern half, or yeah, pretty much the northern half of Illinois. Does that answer the question? That was my question, yeah. Okay. I have a daughter up in Minnesota, and they're not bothered by it. No, they're not going to, no. You can see there's nothing up there. No. Okay. So I guess that's an option for you if you <laughs> <laughs> escape. <laughs> so uh, the second part of that question was, are cic cicadas mainly in central, southern, and eastern U.S.? And it looks like they yeah, are. Yeah, this is it. They're really, once you get over into eastern Kansas, that's pretty much as far west as they go. And the periodical cicada, just a little tidbit that you can bounce off of your neighbors and show them how educated you are. <laughs> They're only native to North America. So again, unique, right? <laughs> the annual is globally, but the periodical, as far as we know, is only uh, native to North America and even this eastern half. So, so we're really privileged. <laughs> uh, so the next question is, um, how did the location of the Southern Illinois brood um, split? So the, according to the map, you have areas of light blue on one side of the Mississippi, I guess, and then you have mm -hmm. uh, some scattered light blue in the southeast. Is there any? Well, from what, from what I read, these guys went with the Confederates, and these, no. <laughs> Each of these broods have developed on their own, their own schedule, they're all on a different, I know you can't see this, but if you go on the internet, I just Googled the periodical cicada map and this popped up, that's how I've used it. But oh, they're all color coded here, of course, and they're all on a different schedule. So they all developed independently based on their climate, of course, obviously, the farther south you get, the shorter the, the, the uh, period is versus the northern ones. But they're all separate populations. Yeah, so what I meant was that you see the light blue where you were pointing to, and then you've got that green vertical, and then you have more light blue over on the right. And I was kind of like, right. geez, how did they migrate? Is it just by humans or how? So I would, I don't. Look like they're pretty close together. So right. Like no, I agree. Um, I would say these could have migrated, they're not real strong flyers, but they could have migrated, but uh, based on the, the hosts that were available and such, they yep. settled there. Didn't want to go any farther west. Um, the green is the, uh, that's brood 15, that came out in 2025. And the red was the one that came, let's see, this red is 2013. If you remember uh, about three or four, well, 2021, all the big thing about back in the D.C. area and all that, they had all that emergence, okay? And a lot of Indiana and Ohio, if you remember, there was a lot of discussion about that. We thought we were going to get some in Illinois. There were just three counties there in extreme east central Illinois that overlapped. But yeah, they don't recognize state boundaries, <laughs> which is why I like insects. They're apolitical. All right. So, um, so uh, the next question is, um, should you cover succulent plants? Um, especially like those in a planter on a porch. Their only, their own uh, question was about succulent plants, or herbaceous plants. They're only interested in woody plants. You don't need to worry about herbaceous. That said, if you have something that's really fibrous, that's a herbaceous, like a geranium, or they might attempt that, but they're more interested in the woody plants. So you don't need to worry about your garden plants or flowers or anything like that. They're going to leave those alone. Um, I think I can answer the next one. Um, do they crawl on houses, garages, door entry? Um, we still, in 2007, we had a southern facing white storm door. They seem to love it. So yeah. structures are fair game. <laughs> now, another, another, that brings up, some, just jog my memory. Something else we'll want to pay attention to in 90, 1990 when they came out, they were out really pretty much late May that year, and we had some nights in there down in the upper 30s, low 40s, and of course the Arboretum is situated there in the kind of the DePage River Valley. It gets a little colder there, and I remember going each morning going in and seeing how things were looking, and a lot of them didn't, weren't able to either emerge from that shell, we call it, that exoskeleton, or if they did, their wings were distorted, 
and they weren't able to expand them and dry them. So that will be, and I, I didn't mention this earlier, but when those insects emerge like that, or any insect emerges, it's, it's kind of comparable to childbirth in humans. It's an extremely stressful event. They are totally vulnerable to predators, the environment, everything, until they can get those wings expanded and dried where they can fly. And you've seen that with butterflies and moths. Same thing applies with these guys. So if we were to have some really cool nights below 50 degrees down in the 40s when they're trying to emerge, that's going to impact how many of them make it and how many don't either. And I will tell you that the skunks, the possums, the raccoons, they'll just kind of act like vacuum sweepers. And they'll just, <laughs> really, they just slurp them right up. So you won't have to worry too much about you know, them piling up very long, particularly in, in areas like this. I remember in Western Springs, you know, they just, they'd be here today and gone, they're gone within a few days. They'll just clean them right up for you. It's kind of a treat. It's like Halloween for them. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I've got a question about Halloween, but I'll save that one for last. Oh, yeah. Um, is it advisable to use aluminum foil around the base if netting is not available? Yeah, anyway, you could, the question was about using aluminum foil, even like burlap or even paper, anything that would keep them from trying to lay eggs, but only on, you know, I would say stems, any stems under maybe two inches. Otherwise, they should be okay. Now, like you were saying, we've got a bunch of young trees in, in my immediate neighborhood when they replanted after our EF3 three years ago that I'm going to keep an eye on those. It'll be interesting to see how they do. But yeah, anything that you can keep a physical barrier that would keep them, that would be fine. But again, I would get that foil off pretty quick as soon as it's all over with. And you'll know when the, when the volume drops, right? You wake up somewhere, oh, it's quiet. <laughs> Then you'll know. So next question, do cicadas damage uh, mushrooms, uh, mycelium? Question about uh, cicadas, mushrooms, and mycelium. As far as I know, they would not. Mm. Mushroom grower, is that what we're thinking? I just like mushrooms. <laughs> Pardon me? I just like mushrooms. You like mushrooms, yeah. and you're not willing to share. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I know, I've never read anything about them bothering mushrooms. Yeah. All right. If, if anything happens, let me know. That'll be a new one. <laughs> so I'm going to read the question, but I want you to wait until I tell you why the person asking it has asked the question. Oh, okay. So the question well, that's is, a long one too. is it okay to collect the shells? Now, the reason they're asking is last time the cicadas emerged at Halloween, they dressed up as an oak tree and put the shells all over their costumes to scare the children. <laughs> so now you know why they want to do it, but is it okay to collect the shells? Shells are fine. I've got tons of them. I'll have students bring them into me as well. No, it's just, it's just an old chitinous exoskeleton. Our skeleton's internal, theirs is external. That's when you step on them, they go crunch. Right. Yeah, there's nothing, the shells are fine. Yeah. So that's the last of the questions, right. so I just have a few uh, closing announcements and a few thank yous. Um, so our next presentation is on May 14th. It's a history of Chicago land and maps with Don and Tanya Smith. They are the owners of a survey and map making company. They will be bringing an 1891 real estate map of Riverside, among other historic maps, including some that were used in court cases that uh, Abraham Lincoln represented the, the, the claimants in. So that's on May 14th here at the library. That will not be recorded because of their concern uh, for copyright um, over their historic maps. Uh, next uh, Landscape Work Day is this coming uh, Saturday, April 13th, 9 a.m. to noon at Indian Gardens and Patriot Park. Um, that will be held in cooperation with the Riverside Brookfield High School Community Service Day. Uh, <coughs> walking tours are going to begin at the end of May, Sunday, May 26th, and they'll continue the last Sunday of the month through October. Special tours can be arranged on request. Um, so as far as thank yous, um, Dr. Miller and Mike Collins, thank you very much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to think, thank the uh, Riverside Landscape uh, Advisory Commission who prepared the one-page handout and were co-sponsors of this presentation. Uh, Brent Bowles, Diane Silva, and the Riverside Library staff in the Thank you. They're always good friends to us. Riverside TV, and thank you all for attending. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.